Welcome to the Carrie Newhoff Leadership Podcast on YouTube. My name is Carrie Newhoff, and my goal is to help you lead like never before. So what I do every week is I sit down with world-class leaders and church leaders, business leaders, and I talk to them about what made them who they are and try to have the conversation with them that you would have if you got to sit down for lunch with them or have dinner with them or really got to spend some time with them. So we go into the backstory and we explore what made them who they are and some of the principles they've learned along the way. So if you enjoy this episode, I would love for you to like it, to subscribe, and also to share it with your friends. And in the meantime, here's today's episode. Scott, welcome to the podcast. So glad to have you. Carrie, I'm thrilled to be here. I love your mission, love the podcast. I know some of your guests and I'm a huge fan of them. Um, And you've done such a wonderful job of helping us develop leaders. I don't think there's anything more important in the world today than helping develop the next generation of incredible leaders. Well, I appreciate that. And thank you to Adam Grant for the introduction as well. A mutual friend, really appreciate that. And a big 76ers fan, right? You were telling me Adam is. He is. Yeah. His kid, I think his kids drag him there, but either way, uh, he's, a, <laughs> he's a wonderful soul, a wonderful, as talented as he is in helping um, provide content that guy, I think, must read content, must oh, listen to content. It's unreal, and and not not just his incredible books, but but also his, his even his LinkedIn. Follow him on LinkedIn. It's a, it's a he's a wonderful. But as great as he is, as smart as he is, as in touch and in tune with he is in the world and what we need, he's as good a human being. Hmm. Yeah, that's fantastic. He has a way of uh, even I follow him on Instagram. And like, even his three lines are better than some books I've written. I'm like, wow, that's a lot of calorie dense thinking there, Adam. Well, well done. Um, so you made a big life change. Uh, you got a new book called Be Where Your Feet Are. And uh, right after it came out, big life change. Why don't we start there? Because you had spent your pretty much entire working career in sports with uh, in New York and in Philadelphia, New Jersey, uh, managing, leading, being the CEO of... Um, you know, an entertainment corp that owns the 76ers and the New Jersey Devils before that, Madison Square Garden sports or entertainment. Um, Amazing, big change. What happened this summer? You know, I I heard a, um, there's a, there's a comedian, Dave Chappelle. Oh yeah. And he was, you know him, he was being interviewed on CBS this morning with Gail King, who I know and absolutely adore. And she asked him, he walked away from his series, the series he had, and she said, well, why? Like, why would you walk away? Like, you had everything going for you. And he said, uh, he said, Gail, and she thought he was telling a joke, okay? But he wasn't. He said, Gail, do you know how a bushman finds water? She said, no, nah, I don't. Know. And, um, and she's like, she, but she's like, am I going to be the butt of the joke? And he said, well, he digs a hole, you know, just, just wide enough so an arm can go through it and put some salt on the bottom. And then a baboon comes and, and reaches his arm down and grabs that salt. And, and won't let go. And so he's so passionate about that salt, he's lifting up and can't get his arm out. Then the bushman comes, you know, grabs the baboon, puts him in the cage, and just keeps feeding the salt. And then after a week or so, lets the baboon run, and he just follows the baboon, goes right to the water, and then they both drink to their fill. Hmm. And, he, and he looks to the camera and says, Gail, at that, you know, at that time in my life, you know, I couldn't let go of the salt. Which is, to me, like, the most beautiful and elegant way and probably the closest thing I can explain as to uh, why I've been on a two and a half month walkabout. Hmm. Um, I, I, I had a wonderful, I, I've had a story career. I've worked with the most incredible people in the world, four amazing people. I've been able to work alongside some of the greatest leaders probably I'll ever have the privilege of working inside again. We, we took a company at HBSC. We took a company when I walked in, it was this little sleepy team who hadn't won 50 games in over a decade was were 27, 28, 29th or 30th in every one of the KPIs in a credible city like Philadelphia, which is very rare to have a, a basketball heavy market. You know, and we built in eight years, built over two, almost two and a half billion dollars of value. And we <laughs> built, bought the devils for the Brentwood Center and, and built the Grand Museum and built the innovation lab and a venture fund and a real estate company and a sports marketing company called Elevate. An esports uh, company, and, you know, we, we had this incredible run, and I just had this sense that um, it was time, and there was hmm. more to do, and to do it differently, 
And um, I'm at a wonderful time in my life. I'm 51 years old. And so I guess this might be my version of a new life pregnancy that has knows. Um, but I'm having a lot of fun. I, um, you know, I, I feel blessed and fortunate. And so I'm not sure what I'm going to do. You know, everyone says, but you know, right. You have a, I know you, you have a plan. And I said, you know, my only plan is to go to Mozambique. And so I, I was, I, I'll talk about that in a second, but I, I spent three weeks in Mozambique helping to build a school with my 18 year old daughter and 20 other teenagers, which was just amazing. But I just kept saying, no, nah. they said, well, what about your book? I said, like, no, nah, my, my book is great. I, lo- I love being with your Peter. It's a, it's a, it's a wonderful message. And I hope it can, can impact some people and change their lives. But that's not what I'm going to do for a living. I, I think I'm, um, you know, you always figure out, you're trying to figure out what you put on this earth for. And I think you figured it out. Like you, you, you have what you're doing it. You know, you 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 grew a church from six members to 1500. That's a, that's a, that's why you're on this earth and you're on this mm-hmm. earth to talk to the leaders and, and hope, help, help us develop both mind, body, and soul as leaders. And I think I'm on this earth to help develop leaders for one. That's, mm-hmm. that's one of my whys. Mm-hmm. Um, and the other would be to to create a, an environment at work that people can replicate in other parts of their life. And I think I'm I'm, I'm meant to. This is going to sound very nebulous and to twenty thousand people. I want to leave the world better than I found it. And I think the best way for me to do that is to operate. That's my gift. Like I manage and lead differently than other people. Um, and so so I think the best way for me to impact as many people as possible, including the communities where we live, work, and play, is to go build something, buy something, build something, or go take another day job. So I'm, I'm thinking through all that stuff. I, I promised myself I, I wouldn't pick my head up until October. And, and we're knocking on that door now. But I, I've had an incredible um, walkabout. Wow. Because, uh, yeah, so there is another chapter. You're just not 100% sure what it is. Can I ask you another question, Scott? Because, I mean, you've, you've got options. I mean, I'm sure, you know, at the level that you have been able to lead at, you don't have to worry about, you know, money and that kind of thing. But why didn't you build it on the side? Like, why the hard stop? What What was the side hustle? There? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I'm not you not you had no time hustle. for side hustle, did you? <laughs> yeah. You know, uh, the, the jobs I, I sign up for, uh, we're kind of all in. You know, I've, I've yeah. got, I have, we all have limited bandwidth. And, you know, I, I have time for, for my work and for my family and for my church. And I don't have much time for, for much else. And, um, and so that's where I choose to spend my time. I, I don't... Um, I don't, I don't think a side hustle, is, I don't think, I think everybody, they, people would, you know, it, it would, anyone who knows me would, would chuckle at even the notion. Not even a joke. That I, that, Cause I, 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 I focus in and focus on, I, I will say, um, in Mozambique, we were, we were there, we were on this work site and, um, the foreman didn't speak any English and I, I don't speak Portuguese. And, and fortunately we had one young lady on the trip who spoke Portuguese and she was help, helpful in translating, but, um, I remember uh, I was on the unskilled labor part. You know, I, 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 I can't do anything. I remember one day I was, uh, you know, for three days actually, but the first day I was, I was uh, moving cement. You know, they were mixing cement and they were putting it in the wheelbarrow and, and I would take the wheelbarrow and I would, I would go, you know, supposedly down this two by four, you know, about down this hill and then make a left and go up this little ramp and up onto the sidewalk, move it over to where one of the school rooms were, one of the kids would, would pick up the end of the wheelbarrow, wheel it in, and then the kids would take it and plaster wherever they were doing. And so the first time down, I all I could think about was when I was 14 years old. And I, I did this, I was digging pools and I was little, I was 80 pounds. And I, I you know, I, I would go up to two by four and just kind of lean and tip over. And, and I'd either get yelled at or laughed at one, one or the other, but I was just not big enough. And I, I was kind of chuckling at that, at that image of myself. And thinking like, well, now I'm at least 100 pounds heavier. I'm gonna have no problem with this, you know. So I'm I'm pretty confident. I'm like, oh, kids, load it up, load not load it up, load it up. You know, I, I get on that two by four, and I start going down the hill. About halfway down the hill, I'm like, uh oh, I'm not gonna be able to make this left turn. <laughs> and I shoot, I shoot right. You know that <laughs> you have, you know, right? Uh-huh. So I shoot right off into you know, and it's it's sand out there. So so I yeah. go off this two by four in the sand. It's probably like two or three inches of sand. And uh, and I'm stuck. And uh, I'm 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 putting all my weight now against this wheelbarrow. And I'm moving it maybe an inch every ten seconds or so. And uh, my daughter Kira and her friend Sophie come over and said, uh, "Kira says, hey, Dad, you want us to help you?" I said, "Yeah, sure." So they just pick it up, put me back on the tube before, and I'm off my way. And, and and I was looking for the lesson in that, um, other than the humility. Um, and I, I think for me, it's really analogous to to my life and I think others' lives. And and that's that. If, if that two by four is life, 
it's freaking hard. Okay. It's hard. <laughs> Marriage is hard. Life is hard. Work is hard. Relationships are hard. Roommates are hard. Partners are hard. Friends are hard. Um, you know, for some people, it's getting out of bed is hard, you know, and, and we have to work really hard to stay on, on, you know, on that path. And when we go off, the only thing harder than that path is when you're off that path. And so whatever that path means to you, does it mean like you're working hard, you're living the right way, you're making the right decisions, you're on your knees and praying, you're whatever it is on your path of life that you think is your best version of your best self, it's hard. Hmm. But it's not as hard as when you go off that path. And, and what was disappointing to me at that point was when I went off the path, this metaphorical path, I didn't raise my hand and say, hey, Kira, can you come help me? Sophie, can you come help me? And they came to me. And I, I've seen through COVID um, some, some, a lot of people struggling. And, and I just invite the listeners that if you're struggling out there, raise your hand and get some help. Hmm. Um, and just know that you can get back on. And you can make a run. It's okay. You're going to fall off the path. I did. You know, I did in life and actually on the path in Mozambique. Um, but I, I think, you know, it, when, when you're at your best and you're healthy, then you can look out for others. Um, but when you're struggling a little bit and maybe working on a, a half full tank, you know, that, that's when you got to lean in and, and take care of yourself. So that yeah, was one I, of my big lessons from Mozambique. Well, thank you for being so transparent and for sharing that. And uh, I would be on the same crew as you would in Mozambique, just so you know. I would be like, okay, back of the line of the unskilled labor. Uh, we don't know what he can do. Um, maybe take pictures. I don't know. Um, what, when you mentioned you hinted at a, an empty tank or a half full tank or falling off the path, what, what do you mean by that? What, what happened to make you go, okay, I'm going to make a change to the extent that you're comfortable sharing? Uh, the change at work? Yeah, or whatever you meant by that, that, you know. Well, I mean, yeah. I'll, I'll, I'll tell you the, the impetus to writing the book was my best friend took his own life and I fell apart. Mm-hmm. And so um, his name is Will Carden, who, you know, I met at business school 20 years earlier. We were inseparable. Um, my, my kids call him Uncle Will. Hmm. Um, his kids um, are like sons and daughters to me. And uh, his wife's a dear friend. And, you know, I'd seen him two weeks earlier. We were at this base, we put this baseball tournament on every year. My brother's not, it's hilarious. Um, and he came out and he was really struggling. And I didn't get it. Like I, I heard him, like, and he was saying things like, I'm struggling. And I kept saying, like, you should just choose to be happy. Like, I, it was so painful what I said. Like, my, you know, I, I, um, this wasn't, it's not a proud moment for me when I think back on, on the advice I gave. Like, hey, serve others. That's what I do when I'm struggling. Like, this guy wasn't struggling. Like, he was, in, de- in like full on depression and should have been in their institution. And I, um, and so he went, went home and, you know, went to his folks house and saw himself. And, um, and so I, I, uh, I, I went, I went totally off the reservation. Like I, you know, I talk in the book about how I told my kid, which was just like, Uncle Will's dead. And I walked up the stairs. That's, that was how. Yeah, you said it was almost robotic, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, was, it was really painful. And then I'm speaking at the funeral, and I just come off the come off the rails, and I couldn't get out of bed in the morning. I couldn't go to sleep at night. I, I like burst into tears at work, and somebody said something that's completely unrelated. And I just started to to write to feel, and I, you know, I wish in high school, I wish I just got help, just got to see somebody, got to see a therapist, you know, um, go to see my executive coach, some somebody, you know. And, um, and so I was just writing it, right? Almost like, I don't know if you saw Forrest Gump, but, you know, he yeah. runs, 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 runs. Like, that's the only analogous thing I can think of in terms of how it's right. He just kept running. Like, if you really think about why the heck he was running or where he was running from or where he was running to, it's really interesting to think about. For me, that's why I was just writing. I just got my iPad out, got my little keyboard on there, and I just wrote. And, you know, I was like 300 pages, and most of it was just gibberish. Um, but a lot of it was just stories of perseverance and where I fell down and what I learned. And, um, and I had a friend come visit me. Actually, my wife's friend, Randall Wright, he's, right, he's an author. And he's like, you need to, you need to put some in ink. And I was like, nah. I was like, this is kind of like my own journal. This is my own, this is my, this is my healing. This is my therapy. This is my whatever. And his view was, hey, you have one person, you do it. You know? So that's, that's your life mission. That's what you, that's how you built a career. That's how you spend friendship. 
And so, uh, so then I went, I went down that path, but that's an example where I, I just didn't, I didn't, I mean, I lost my grip, you know, mm. and, uh, you know, to say I went off into the sand, I just kept, you know, I just kept digging deeper and deeper and deeper and, um, and, and I couldn't fish myself out. And there have been plenty of times in life where I've had a difficult time. Ne- never quite like that before. I, I never, I don't know. I never experienced grief or depression, whatever that phase was in my life. I'd never experienced it, but it's also helped me explore, you know, this formula. I've, I've been speaking to a lot of companies lately from Google to a bunch of sports teams to tech companies and, uh, you know, my formula for, for mental health and wellness, and by the way, I think there's an epidemic in this country, right? Now. Mm. And I think there's going to be a lot written about it five years from now, but it's right now. You know, people are alone. They have anxiety. They're struggling. They don't know what they want. They don't know what makes them happy and what makes them sad. Um, but my formula for, for well-being is do something for your mind, something for your body, and something for your soul every day. Get the right amount of sleep. Practice gratitude. And be where your feet are, which in my vernacular is put your phone down, put your head up. And, and the first three are, are simple, but not easy. But something for your mind is easy. It's like, listen to this podcast. Like once a day, like listen, read a, listen to a TED talk, read an article outside of your core job. Just learn something, stretch that mind of yours, you know? And something for your body, it's like 20 minutes. That's it. 20 minutes to get your heart rate going. Me, I'm like a Peloton junkie now. And it's actually helped clear my mind and my body and my soul. Um, if I can't get a pickup hoop running, that's what I'm doing for 45 minutes. And, um, and the soul, you know, somewhat, it's not complicated to talk with you, but when I talk to companies or folks I work with, it's sometimes complicated. Yeah. And I, I always say like, Hey, you don't have to get on your knees and pray. Like I do a read scriptures, like I do a go to church and that that's not for everyone. That's for me. Um, but you don't have to do that, but you do have to find some stillness in your life. You do have to like tap into that soul. And that stillness can find, you can find very many different ways to find the stillness. You can, you can meditate a wonderful way to find it you can do yoga you can sit outside and listen to the birds chirp but you you have to still your mind for 10 months to 10 minutes a day and, and i still mind very differently but but we all have to find ways and then sleep is i'm um, sleep is the is fuel you know that that heals your mind body and soul so and i've brought in some of the top sleep experts in the world to speak with our athletes over the years and they all say the same thing it's like six and a half to eight and a half hours and like, i don't care if you're superman or not sleep you know and it depends on your dna and your lifestyle where you live and all that kind of stuff depends on if it's six and a half or eight and a half but you need sleep and then gratitude is the simplest one um oftentimes when i'm talking to corporate groups well i'll tell you this well so i, I always start the corporate group i say hey all right take your phone out and everybody say, thinks i'm gonna say i put it on your seat or put it away i said no take your phone out i want you to text your mom I want you to text her this note some version of this note mom i love you i appreciate everything you've done for me throughout my life I know sometimes I don't say it, but just know you're always in my heart. I love you. Some version of that. Okay. And I said, take 60 seconds. Then you got to take the 60 seconds. And I, and, and I alternate, send a note to my mom, then a note to my mother-in-law. Note to my mom, note to my mother-in-law. And the first time I sent to my mom, you know, she said, "Hun, are you okay? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Wow. No bueno, as they said. Um, yeah. And so it's, but, but what a great, what a great me- a lesson, right? It's like, this is my mom. Okay, she's literally given me everything I have in my life. I can trace back to my mom. Every advantage in the world that I've ever had, every lesson I learned, every good quality I have in my life is about my mom. And um, and that that's that's hard. Um, and so anyway, so then the, I challenge everyone. So I'll challenge your listeners now to do go on a thirty day gratitude challenge. You wake up in the morning and you spend sixty seconds a day saying a note of gratitude, love, or appreciation to someone in your life. It could be a mentor, a teacher, a teacher, a coach, a sibling, a brother, a sister, a coworker, whoever, somebody in your life a day for 30 days. And the, the reality of this is gratitude impacts you, the sender, more than it does the receiver. But, but I, I do believe that like Heavenly Father will put people in your head that you need to speak to, that I need to hear from you. Not I, I tell you, like for me, stillness in this shower, I get stillness in this shower. I don't think that's what I think about, but I'm alone and it's quiet and I'm peaceful. And people will fly into my head. And I get out of the shower and I send them a note. And more often than not, I'll get a note back that says, I needed to hear from you today. Hey, I was really struggling. Thank you very much. You know, and you just say like, man, oh man, that is the, if you, if you don't believe, you know, don't have an organized religion or you don't believe in a higher power, okay, then it's the universe. It's something that's, that's putting something in my head that, of goodness to send out there. And I, I will tell you like, as nice as those notes are, I think the gratitude does more for me than it does the people I send. So I think that's a really simple one. And then the, the phone, I, you know, I, I think it's, you know, our, our phones are, are causing a lot of the, 
the anxiety and, and depression and, and um, the feeling of being alone that we're finding in society today. And, and you just need to self-regulate. I know it's really hard, but you know, what are your rules? Like if we don't have phones in our, or electronics in our bedrooms in our house. Okay. That doesn't make me the most popular dad in the world. Okay. We don't have phones at the kitchen table. We don't have phones in the kitchen. We have, there are some apps we don't allow in our house. You know, I know you have adults, so this is a little different, but I, we got, we got it on lockdown and the kids hate it. You know, I'm like, I know because you can't self-regulate because I have a hard time self-regulating myself. So what are my rules? You know? And, and, um, and I think we all can be better about making sure that, that the phone's not dependent. I, I was at dinner with some friends the other day and they're all sitting around their phone. I'm like, God, what the heck are we doing? I haven't seen you guys in here. What, what's so important? Like, but what is, I honestly, like I ask my kids all the time, like, what's so important? Like, what are you missing? Like it's an hour. I'm asking for an hour a day that we can connect. What, what, what are you going to miss? Text? You know that friend that puts that little emoji, like the point up emoji, if you don't respond uh-huh. in two seconds? You know, that's not how life works. Like, in my opinion, I think we're missing it. Anyway, so that's my point. Oh, that's a, that's a fantastic philosophy. Two quick notes. Uh, I've heard of gratitude journaling and practiced it, but the idea of a note of gratitude to another human every day for 30 days, convicting. I'm going to try that. Can I that's tell you the really thing about my daughter? So my 14-year-old, yeah. Her name's Eliza, and uh, she's been keeping a gratitude journal for three years. It's actually 1,400 days, but two days ago, in a row. So she writes 14 things before she goes to bed. She's a little OCD like her dad. 14 things she's never repeated. She's got 1,400, never repeated. Wow. 1,400 days. And I just think like, and by the way, she's not a very positive person. She, just, she doesn't, you know, I wake up like, hi, everyone. You know, she, that's not how she wakes up. So I think it's her own, like, self, self-regulatory self gauge to help her uh, be grateful. Um, and the other thing she has, which I think is literally the cutest thing in the history of the world. And if she ever listens to this, I'll be in trouble. Hmm. But uh, she has the happy thoughts clicker. And so hmm. before she goes to bed, every time she sees a happy thought, she clicks it. And so you can hear it click, click, click. And I think, man, oh man, how much better would the world be if we all had happy, happy thoughts clickers? Wow. Isn't that great? That is a great idea. I oh. love it. I just love it. I love, I love, I love, I mean, she's an amazing kid. Um, she's probably taught me more about life and relationships and people. She's very introverted. Um, she's got some social anxieties, n- n- neither of which I understood. Hmm. And so, so I, 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 I connect to my older two daughters very quickly and her, I, I struggled. And, um, and I, I learned from her, you know, I had, it's so funny. I, I reached out to people that, that worked with me before and, and, and didn't make it. And, um, and I just apologized for them because I was, I was running my organization. Like, like they're all type A lunatics like me. <laughs> and, and you know what I lost? I lost creativity. I lost, mm-hmm. um, creative ideas. I lost, um, thoughtfulness, more sensitivity, all that stuff that she brings to the world because she sees the world very differently. And she doesn't want to be put on the spot. She doesn't want to be called out. She doesn't want to present in front of her room. That's, that, that's not how she goes through the world. And uh, anyway, I've learned so much from her. But, uh, you know, it's been... Um, but anyway, I love the, her two practices every day, for sure. Oh, that's great. I uh, sounds like you have a great family, Scott. And uh, appreciate your vulnerability, too. The other thing I was going to say is... And you talk about this in the book, too. And that's sort of the whole idea, be where your feet are, right? Like, if we're having this conversation, I'm not also checking my phone. I'm not also thinking about what's next. I'm fully present, fully engaged. I was listening to uh, the Tim Ferriss show, Tim Ferriss podcast. He was interviewing, I think it is Sheila Heen is her name from the Harvard Negotiation Project. She had this one line in the middle of an interview. It was a throwaway to her, I think, but like clarified everything in my life. And what she said is, they were talking about difficult conversations. She said, our conversations are our relationships. And I'm like, oh my gosh, yes. Like I've been married three decades and what is my marriage with my wife? It is a thousand conversations in a thousand different contexts and shared experiences. All your friendships, what are they? They're conversations. And I'm worried about the death of conversation. Uh, I find that the good conversations are, are harder to have now than they were maybe 20 years ago. And part of that is distractions and technology and everything. So 
really appreciate we enable that. them. We enable it. Like we, mm. you know, it's like we walk into a conference room and, you know, I had a, again, I mean, can you imagine being like a, a Gen Zer and working with me? Like, they're like, what do you chisel stuff in the stone? What do you expect me to use a pen? I'm like, cause I had to check all their phones on the side of the room in this little, uh, we had a cell phone table in every room, every conference room. And, um, cause I worry like, use a pen. like, yeah, it's not going to kill you. Grab a pen, you know, but the reality is, it's like, it's not the meeting. It's like before the meeting and after the meeting, that's what we're missing. Like, Hey, how was your weekend? Hey, I understand your kid at a soccer game. Hey, your daughter scored a winning goal. Hey, I heard you went on vacation or how's that project going? We're missing all that. Cause we're like checking TikTok videos. Like it doesn't make sense. And so like we, we are the leaders of the world. Like we have to figure out how to create that that meeting and create those moments and there's some things you can do at the start of meetings that again um may sound a little too kubaya for some folks but but for me it's like okay hey can we go around the table and, and share just a, a a note of gratitude like what are you grateful for hmm. why don't you start meetings like that why not that's a great idea oh man we 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 had so many cool like during zoom during um the covid rush I was with my senior team every day for the first six months and, um, and everybody was tasked one, a, a different person was tasked every day to have an exercise. And so it could be as simple as share a photo that, that, that could be simple or read this article and tell us three things that you'll take away from it. It was, it was like that, or it was, you know, tell us three things you're grateful for, or tell me about your best vacation. And like, it became this incredible every day. It was my, hundred percent be where my feet are engrossed connected and we just we became we came to know each other on such a different level because we we got to know about their first concert but we also got to know about their their biggest fears and their biggest dreams and everything in between it was such a wonderful way to go through a very dark time and and i think brought the group as close together as they've ever had been yeah i've heard that we right that's the leaders you know that's on us you and I were talking before we hit record about Patrick Lencioni and Pat had a similar thing where uh, on this podcast, he said the Zoom calls with his staff, he said, we were always tight and they're a small group. They're like sub 20, under 20. But he said, when you saw, you know, the cat and then the kids running around and they're in a bedroom or they're in the kitchen and he says, man, I just felt like we grew to a whole other level of intimacy we never had before in person. Yeah, I love that. I, I love when, and, and you know, you see like the moms come out and the dads come out. Like, can mm-hmm. you please stop running in here while I'm on a call? And I would crack up every time, you know, or like a football mm-hmm. shooting across the screen or a dog would mm-hmm. tackle. I mean, I, I love that. I, I totally agree with that. Like, I think that's, that's a really good insight. So one of the things, and, and thank you for being open to talking about several decades in sports because I, I want to go there, but this has been fascinating. Uh, you opened the book saying you don't believe in balance. And that is something, a value I share. I say, abandon balance, embrace passion. What's your take on balance and what's wrong with it? And what's the alternative? Well, there's several things wrong. I mean, that's, first of all, the first question I get asked every time I speak in front of a group. Really? Every single time. Um, And I I always, the analogy I use in the book is just... Like the question is like, hey, how do you you balance everything being the CEO of a big organization? How do you find work-life balance in your life? How how can I work in sports but find a good balance? You know, I I take them back to my life and I ask them, you know, first of all, I haven't met anyone who has any um, measure of success. I I, I use my words very carefully because success means something different to everyone. Okay, so... yeah. Okay, so, so, so I, I just want to be very careful in terms of how you interpret what I'm saying. Um, but I haven't met anyone who has met any level of success in any, any fact of life that hasn't worked unreasonably hard. Person. Mm. You know, if, if that were the case, everybody would run to it. And then it'd be too many people and it'd be hard again. It's just like the very, very nature of economics, you know? Yeah. And so you, have, you have to work unreasonably hard. And, um, and so I look for moments in creating memories. And, and if you go through life... Okay, you stop like the pretense, uh, and, and you say, "Okay, let me walk through life." Now I have girls. I know. You, I know you're empty. I have, I have three daughters. Two are still at home. I call the morning the NCAA tournament because it's survivor dance. And I, my wife and I look at each other. We're like, roll our eyes. We're like, oh, bro, let's see if we can get these ladies out of the house in one piece without a nuclear meltdown. 
Someone forgot a water bottle or the utility office not washed. What, what, I can't find my sneakers. You're borrowing my tea, whatever it is, okay? Just get them out. There's nothing meaningful happening in our house anymore. It just doesn't happen. I hope it happens in everybody else. It doesn't happen around there. Then they're in school. They got chili. They got basketball. They got homework. They got boyfriends. They got to talk about. They've got, you know, some downtime they need. I'm at work. So how much time do I have? Like, what is it, an hour? At least in COVID, I got, you know, I had a family dinner. So it's wonderful. So let's say you have an hour a night, a legit hour a night with teenagers. How do you want to spend that hour? That's what I ask them. Like, how do I want to spend the hour? Not, hey, I'm on a, if I'm on the five, I'm not seeing them anyway. But if I have an hour, then how am I going to spend it? Am I going to spend it on my phone? Am I going to spend it working on my iPad? Am I going to spend it binging Netflix? Am I going to get my workout in at the one hour a day that I can spend time with them? Mm. Am I going to like, hey, I need, I need a break. I'm, I'm tired from work. I'm exhausted. I just need a break. I need to be by myself. Is it during that one hour? And, and I think when you start figuring out like how much time you actually have with the people that we claim are the most important people in the world to us, I think you, you, it's, a, it's quite an awakening and it provides you an opportunity to think about, okay, now, how do I want to program that time? How do I want to spend that time? What, what moments can I create? What, like I, I, you know, this is, I, I talk about a couple of these things in the book, you know, like I had one exercise through YPO Young Presidents Organization where they, they like pressed me and my daughter and, and the question was like, you got 30 minutes, you'll never see your daughter again. What are you going to tell her? And the biggest disappointment for me was like, why haven't I had that conversation? Hmm. Why not? Like I had another YPO with one of my other daughters and it was, um, Dr. Karen Gordon, a Toronto native, amazing. Oh, yeah. Oh, you know her? Well, no of, but yeah, sure, sure, Toronto-based. She's yeah. making a joke because you, you would dig her. And she, she said, and she said, um, write a love letter to each other. So we wrote a love letter and read it to each other. And I was like, man, like this is simple stuff, right? Like, are we creating those opportunities just to tell? Now, this, again, these two of my daughters, these are two of the people that I love more than anyone in the world. Okay, if I had to rank people how much I love them to be, you know, the four people in my family above everyone, everyone else would be a died for a second or less. I mean, these are the people I love most. And I hadn't had those conversations. I, all I'd say is I'd advocate for you to just think about who in your life you really care about mm. and, and what me- moments and memories are you doing? But how are you telling and sharing your, the, the feelings that you have because you're thinking it? But why aren't we saying it? Why aren't we sitting down and talking? I mean, look at COVID gave us incredible opportunities to talk about politics, you know? It was a mess in this country. We talked about social justice. We talked about race relations. We talk, I mean, like, what an incredible platform to have real meaningful conversations and argue a bit about a lot. Hmm. And I, I just, I want to be talking about that rather than, you know, who won Dancing with the Stars. And, and there's nothing wrong with Dancing with the Stars. Well, what's going on with The Bachelor? Or, or um, you know, what's my new sweater combination? Or whatever the heck the girls are talking about. Which I'm happy to engage them. But when am I creating that meaningful time? And that, that's kind of honest. That's why it's just to me more important to be where your feet are than to be balanced. Because if I'm with you, I am with you and I'm engaged with you and I'm appreciating every moment, every second I have. And if you check out on me, you should just end a podcast and roll. Right? It's like, and if I said my friends were at lunch, they're on the phones. I'm like, hey, you just have to go. You just go. It's all good. Like, I, it's, it's great. I just want to talk, you know? I think we can be better. I think we can leave our phones in the car. I really do. When we go out to dinner, you go out to dinner with your wife. You really need your phone? Like, who is calling you? Like, what are you looking for? And the reality is, is anybody that calls you, you get them back when you get in the car. Call yeah, me, text exactly. Me it's all good. But like, I think we're, 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 we're misprioritizing what's most important in our life. Yeah, you know it's so funny. I I started notice uh, shutting off my notifications years ago, probably six seven years ago. And you and I had a little challenge connecting, just with technology. You're uh, going out of your way to make sure you're at a Starbucks, right? And so uh, I I actually opened up all the notifications on my phone so so I could take your phone call, send you a quick text, make sure that we could get connected via Zoom. And I thought I had set my watch to do not disturb, and I hadn't. And I felt this really strange thing. My my wrist is vibrating and I'm like, oh my gosh, I don't have do not disturb on. So during this interview, I'm like, mm, do not disturb. It's like an and it's amazing. Yes. Oh, it is. It's fantastic because, 
you know, whoever that was, they'll be there in an hour when we're finished. Like, that'll be fine. And in the meantime, that that goes for date night with my wife. That goes for time with my kids who are now grown. It's even more precious when you have an hour with them or a couple of days with them. You want to be fully dialed in and, and fully present. Be where your feet are. Um, I want to talk to you about personnel a little bit. So uh, Adam told me, Adam Grant said, he said, uh, he's heard that on multiple occasions, you may have encouraged uh, people to leave your organization for better opportunities. In other words, I work for you and you're like, you know what, Kerry, you shouldn't stay here at HBSC. You should head off and take that job somewhere else. First of all, is that true? Or is, is, is there a slightly different version of that? And if so, why? It kind of feels like shooting yourself in the foot. I'm going to let this guy go to do something else. I'd love to get your philosophy of like building a culture and a team. Yeah. I mean, there, there are two scenarios where that happened. Um, first of all, um, everybody has their own gifts or superpowers or, you know, talent. Yeah. Mine seems to be attracting talent. Okay. Mm. So, so that's a, that's a fun one to have. Um, and so I, I've, um, in the places that were, I just give you one small example. I ran a small group at the NBA and um, it's probably, I don't know, 30 people or so. And, you know, Tom Blick was there. He's the president of the Carolina Panthers and their whole. Okay. Chris X, president of the Sixers. Chris Granger just left. He was CEO of the Detroit Red Wings and Tigers. Amy Brooks is president of the NBA. Dan Reed is president of Facebook Sports and Entertainment. I, I literally could go on. Like, this is like a little tiny group. And so, you know, I, I've had, I've had either, either crazy dumb luck or, or and then that is. So these are all people I, I, who are under your leadership at one point or another. Yeah. yeah. Wow. Yeah, yeah, that, uh, it's, it's, it's crazy. And so I, I've had that. Um, I've been blessed to have that throughout my career. And so, and, and my, my contract, my social contract is, is that I love you. And I know you, a lot of people don't use that word at work. I do. It's like, I love you. I am here to help you. Um, I am invested in you, your whole mind, body, soul. I'm going to help you develop and become an extraordinary human being and an extraordinary executive. And in exchange, um, you're going to deal with all my quirkiness and idiosyncrasies and neuroses. You're going to work and reasonably hard. And you're going to commit yourself um, to being an extraordinary teammate and being intellectually curious and growing this business beyond losing uh, and so, and that's a pretty good social contract, you know? And, and so that's, it's almost like, I don't know if you've ever been to Disney, but when you mm-hmm. go to Disney, if you've ever been to Disney in the summer, it's like blazing hot, it's like yeah. 95 degrees and 95% humidity. And you look over in the Jungle Cruise line, there's a, you know, a young woman and she's in the period piece and she works there and she's got to be wearing like 10 pounds of clothes and she is sweating and she's like, Hey, hey everyone, I'm Jan. And I was looking at her and I was thinking like, what the heck is Jan smiling about? And then. I think definitely is like Janice grew up. She she grew up her whole life. Every single day of her life smiling. She self selected into Disney because she knows. And so at my places, people self select in. So so they know what they want. They 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 want what I'm selling now at this point in my career. And and for that, I want them to go and, and change the world. So one version is, um, which has happened on a few occasions, several occasions, is that you know people have outgrown our ability to grow, you know? And, and so one of the things at HBSC, we, we grew from, you know, we, we did like a six and a half or seven X in the business in eight years. And some of it was organic, but some of it was, was acquisitions. So that creates a great platform to put talent up and move them. And I, I'm somewhat infamous internally for moving people into roles where they have no experience. So um, I'll give you one example. I have several, but I'll give one example is my favorite is uh, Brittany Boyd who was at the New York Met, no, Brooklyn Sports Entertainment. We brought her over to be director of guest services. And, um, and she's a star. Like I knew she was a star when I interviewed her. Two seconds after I interviewed her, I'm like, whoa, this would be a star. And so we went on a ride with her. And, you know, I think she's been there four or five years and she's moved to three jobs. So I, we, we took her there and then we put her in charge of operations of the building and then, and then moved her to a, a, a revenue role because I wanted her to touch revenue. Um, then I moved her to chief marketing officer of the Sixers. So and people are like, she's got no marketing experience. I, I go, I know she's a star. No matter what the job is, like she's going to be a star no matter where we put her. And I want to put her in a spot where I think she can have the biggest impact in this organization. Like, yeah, but didn't she start in guest services? I'm like, sure. And I started as an assistant. Great. Like it's, you know, and so 
Um, Katie O'Reilly is another, another uh, gal who was an assistant when I was at the NBA and is now the chief revenue officer at the Sixers. Being like, well, how did that happen? I'm like, she's a total baller. That's how it happened. And we <laughs> moved her out of her comfort zone four or five different times. Um, and so I, you know, I, so, so it's, it's very similar philosophy. It's like, you know, if we don't have that opportunity, I want people to be fulfilled. It's a really small industry too. We end up doing deals with just about everyone. So there's a Machiavellian, uh, I, I, that's not why I do it, but there is a Machiavellian reason. It's like, you know, you wake up someday and you can do a deal with anybody in the world and the business is pretty helpful. The, hmm. the other scenario, which is was slightly different, um, which is when you have to let people go, because, um, I, I never want people to confuse culture with being soft because our culture is one of accountability. Like that's one of our, it's always been a core tenant of mine. And so, and just to give you a, this kind of the raw numbers that'll, that'll have you raise your eyebrow. When I got to the Sixers, we bought the Devils about a month and a half later. There are only 12 people there from when I started in both those organizations combined. Okay. So, so this is, yeah. And so you can either say, wow, this guy's a tyrant. What is he doing? Or, Boy, they were a bunch of idiots. They couldn't couldn't uh, couldn't do anything when he first got there. You know those things are true, right? But when you come in and their organizations are underperforming and it's a change environment, and you set expectations, I, I, I've been told that I set unreasonably high expectations, which I would say, but you keep hitting them. But yes, I'm I'm, I'm definitely I've been accused of worse. And but the way I fire people is very different. Like I I you know I had this notion that. That you were smart, you were talented, you were hardworking, you were a wonderful teammate when I hired you. Like nothing's changed, but something's not working. And so if I if I Gary, if I were to fire you and, and we work together, yeah. first of all, there would be no surprises. Okay, like you would know mm-hmm. that it's not working because I would have told you five times. I don't I don't shy away from bad news. I like lean into it. I don't shy away from conflict. I lean into it. Um, and I want to make sure that there's a transparency so that you know what I love and you know what I don't love. And you know what you're doing well, and you know what you're not doing well. And you know what you need to do. Um, and after several of those conversations, I would call you and say, hey, Carrie, this isn't working. Um, uh, I, I love you. I think you're amazing. Um, you're the same talented person that we hired three years ago. Um, but, but your future here is not happening. Like you're, hmm. you know, I know that you want to grow here. It's not happening. Okay. So what I would like to do is I would like you to think about what you want to do next. And I want to help you along your path. And the person said, what do you mean? And I said, well, I don't have the free world in this business. I'm happy to make an introduction. I'm happy to be a reference for you. And you don't have to leave your job. So how long do you think it will take you to find the opportunity that's right for you? Three months, six months? Usually three months. I was like, great. Here's our contract. You don't tell anybody we're having this conversation. Are we good? Yeah, we're good. You work as hard as you've worked since you got here. Are we good? Yep. And let's, let's help you on your path and find a new way. So there are different reasons why people might leave an organization. Some because they need to stretch and grow. Some because it's not working out. And, uh, and others because they've had this incredible opportunity. And like, I, I will tell you, like I've had, before I left, I had like six or seven people, like double and triple the salaries. And I was just like, you know, go have at it, you know? Hmm. And the only thing I ask them to do is like, I always say like, I just want you to bring the three or four things that you found in this culture and this leadership style, management style, and I want you to implement them wherever you're going. Because I, I think we, we, we as a, you know, the, the corporate world need to be better. And so I, I talk about that a lot. And so, so it's a, it's a combination of things, but yeah, I, I, I don't believe in, in lifetime employment. I have uh, my grandfather um, worked for MetLife. He came over as a soccer player in Scotland and, um, and he testified against MetLife when he was really young in his career, and they froze him. So back then, they didn't have a lot of mobility. And so he sat in a crappy job uh, his, his whole life. And, and consequently, my, my, uh, my dad and his five siblings slept in the same bed growing up. So he was in bed with, with uh, six kids in the whole bed and, um, in a two-bedroom, tough neighborhood in Bayside, Queens. And so, so you know, you always look to the past and say, like, okay, what is informing this behavior you know I, I think somewhat in some ways you know with my grandfather not having mobility i think that him impacted and influenced the way i i look at others mobility and their opportunities mm. to to grow and learn in different places so i i think if i'm on a couch that's what would come out that's perceptive so you hinted at it scott every leader listening to this would probably say okay i've got some quirks and idiosyncrasies as well 
Where where do you draw the line? If you wouldn't mind sharing an example of what you could consider an idiosyncrasy or a quirk, where do you draw the line between, okay, this is just the way it is and this is who I am and this is actually perhaps hurting the organization? Have you been able yeah. to draw that line? Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, well, well, I'm sure. Um, boy, idiosyncrasies. I, I, I definitely have... Um, I want things to go perfectly all the time. Okay. That mm. that's a quirk. Okay. And that's, and I don't say that with any source of pride because that, that's not a, that's not an attainable bar, you know? Right. I expect right. like a passion level that is sometimes unreasonably high and a commitment level that's mm. sometimes unreasonably high. I, um, I, I, I will, will call people out and up regularly, you know? Mm. Um, and put them on the spot. I, um, so, so I have a lot of things that, you know, don't work for everybody. Mm. I, I just don't, um, how they hurt, how, how I work around them is the people that work with me are very different. So I, I consciously, um, uh, look for people who have very different personalities and skill sets than I do because the mix is the magic, right? It's, yeah. it's like, um, it's like I remember the Lakers had like Gary Payton and Carl Malone and somebody else on their team, like three kind of old superstars, and it didn't work. Um, and and I think that's analogous with with teams. I think it's analogous with families and, and teams at work. And I think to the extent you can find that right mix of people that have different idiosyncrasies, you know, different challenges, and different highs and lows, and different uh, ways they they see the world and approach the world. I think that that helps to balance it out. I also, I'll give you an example. Um, mm -hmm. When I first got to the Sixers, I was, um, look, it's, it's high change. Like, you know, when you're in a change situation and you know, when you're in a steady state and I was in a high change situation, there, yeah. there, there was nothing about the organization that I was proud of when I walked in. Mm. Nothing. And so I was on the war path. And so that's not a good, when you say you're on a war path, that's not a great place to be as a leader. You know, mm -hmm. so I took my tour of the building. I'm pointing out, you know, stuff that needs to be addressed. And, um, and then I, you know, we had some things in the organization that were just flat out not inspiring. And I was addressing them. And there's some cultural things that are inappropriate would, would be kind. Okay. And, mm -hmm. and that's not okay. And so I was addressing those aggressively. And so we brought this young guy in to uh, meet one of the issues and problems. And, and I said, just sit tight. Everything will be cleared up. I just need you to stay with me. Okay. And again, I have, you know, because I've been in this business for so long and I've worked with a lot of good people, my reputation gives me a little bit of leeway with recruiting people in where right. I know you're going to be in a different job. I need you to stay with me. Okay. And it might be two months or three months or a year, but just know I love you. I'll stay with you, but I need you here. You know, and here's your role. And so was, he, he was in a little bit of limbo. And uh, anyway, eventually the, the path was clear and he, he uh, assumed the role. And, and I said, to, I said, sweep the house, you know, meaning fire. Mm. Okay. Wow. I said, it's just too much, it's too toxic. I, I don't want that environment here. Um, I don't think it's healthy. I don't think it can be fixed. And he's like, we're going to lose some good people. I'm like, I hear you. I, I don't want to discriminate. Everybody's out. So he comes in one day and he's like, Scott, this person needs to stay. And I was like, get out of my house. You, know? he you said what? And Sorry, like, I missed that. Get out of my house. Get out. Get him out. Yeah. Get out. You get out. You know? Oh, you get out. I don't have this conversation. Wow. Yeah, yeah. I don't want to have this conversation anymore. He comes back in the next day. He's like, hey, I know what you said yesterday. I'm listening to you, but you brought me here for a reason. And I think this person has a lot of talent. And I think you got to back off. And I was like, I do not want to have this conversation with you. He comes back the next day. And I said, I said, you know, is this person gone? And he's like, he's like, he looks at me, he's like, when are you going to let me do my job? And I looked at him, and I, oh yeah, I was like, welcome to the team, brother. And, uh, and that's, that, that is what I love. And so, now look, everybody's different. Every leader's different. By the way, uh, this person ended up being a, a complete superstar. He was right, of course. I was, of course, wrong. Um, it's, just, it's, it's just wonderfully inspiring. To think about my instincts, but but I, I I love that story because of what he had passion 
He had conviction. And he's willing to stand behind his ideas because I said to him, I said, okay, big shot. You know, because he's a young, really young guy. I said, okay, big shot. It's on you then. He's like, that's normally I want it. I'm like, oh, we're going to get on. I literally was like, we're going to get along really well because he was strong enough to take me on, right? Because that's what, that's, that's how you build a great team. Like you want a great team. That's it right there. And, um, and, and, and good on me, like self props, good on me for like, you know, seeding to uh, a younger, smarter, more talented, more aware, more connected person to make the right decision. So that's, that's how I think, you know, again, when you're starting about talking about building extraordinary teams or creating the greatest place to work in the world or, you know, reimagining what it means to work in this business, all phrases that I use repeatedly in terms of building an organization, because I want that, you know, when, when you're a leader, you sometimes got to say the same thing a thousand times in a row. And so people start thinking like, okay, I understand what the bar is now. Greatest place to work in the world. Now, will we ever hit that bar? No, we won't. You know, will we get close to it? No, I hope we get on that curve. That's what I'm hoping for. Yeah. You know, are we going to reimagine what it means to work in this business? Maybe not. But can we get closer to it? Probably. And so, so that's how I, I like to, to, that's how I think through. It gives you a little sense of, of how I think and how I operate. I appreciate the insight into the tough stuff. And those are really hard calls. You've probably shaken a few leaders already with like, oh, I don't know whether I could do that. However, you are known around the industry and across industries as a builder of great cultures and great teams. What are some keys to building a healthy culture in your mind, Scott? Yeah, a couple of things. One is, uh, you know, people, people, people. Um, I think another thing is making sure that your expectations are clear. Hmm. Uh, another thing is just to make sure that there's buy-in across the organization. Um, there's a feedback loop. That there's healthy debate, sometimes conflict, which I like. It's not everybody likes. You know, I like when people mix it up. Don't get personal, but mix it up a little bit. I, I love the debate. Um, I like common language. I mean, there's some, some terms in, in Be Where Your Feet Are that I've used, like WMI or API or Trust the Process. So I, I, there have been more than one occasion. And, you, you know, I'm not sure if you can tell because I'm, I'm in a total, you know, I told you, I'm in a, I'm in a Zen walkabout right now. So I definitely have some intensity to me at work. Hmm. And so um, we, we use this expression, API, which means assume positive intent. Okay. Right. And one of the terms we use around API is palms up, meaning like literally your palms are up. Mm. They're not crossed in front of you. Like, so when their palms are up, I'm open. All I'm saying is I'm open. I'm open to listening. I'm open to learning. I'm not carrying the bug. There's no luggage from our last conversation. Right. There's no baggage that I'm carrying that you might have with your mom or your brother or sister, or an old boss or all that crap that builds up. So when you're assuming positive intent, I'm like, I'm free. So there have been multiple times where my executives will walk in and they'll start like this, Scott, I need you palms up here. Hmm. I need you API. I need your brain and I need your experience. I do not need your emotion. And I was like, oh, okay, what's the situation? So now what they're signaling to you there is like, okay, this guy can be a lunatic sometimes. That's what they're signaling, right? <laughs> Like we've seen him react. Uh huh. And what I'm also, what we're also seeing is like, I'm like, okay, I understand this is not one of those times. And I need my, I need my wisdom as opposed to my emotion. And so I think having a common language like that is, is wonderful and, and, and impactful. Um, and WMI is what's most important. Is that right? Yeah. Yes. So it's really hard um, when you have a bunch of very driven people who want to do extraordinary things. They say yes to everything. And so what, what WMI is all about is it's about what are our key priorities? Like what matters? What makes us successful? I just want to make sure we're all aligned um, and that we're all signing off on each other's that we online. So at the end of the day, we can, we can accomplish so many things. Um, and so, you know, I might say to you, Carrie, uh, I'm going to need this thing. You know, I've got this new program. He's like, was that part of our WMI? Is that, is that yours or mine? Because it seems to fall in the middle. Like, our, what, what's shuffling off for WMI? Because we can't do everything. And you right. say, right, 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 right. Okay, no, I hear you. All right, let me go back and think about this. So now I have a common language. It's not like, I don't, I'm not doing your work for you. I'm not taking <laughs> on another project. It's not that. It's like, well, can we, can we temperature check here? So I, I think that, that, that's the common language that, that I think um, helps you, you overcome for sure. Hmm. Another so question. I, I just like, okay, sorry. Yeah. No, you go. I want to hear this. Like, 
onboarding, onboarding, onboarding. Um, so it's like, what do the first 90 days look like? All the research in the world will, will tell you that the first 90 days will determine the tenure and happiness of your time in an organization. And so you can manipulate that, you know, and it, it's the right word to manipulate, by the way. So, um, you know, like we, in our place, we switched to be where your feet are. I read the book, but before that it was leaders from self-deception. Everybody had to read a book and then write, read it. And before they started or were announced to the organization, they had to write, here's how this will impact me at home. Here's how this will impact me at work. So now, now I have a dialogue as the CEO in every single new person in. And then we had, a, I also saw them in groups of 12 or 14, depending on the, uh, when they started. I'd see them just one-on-one. And I would start the meeting. I'd say, I'd love to talk about life, love, the pursuit of happiness, or anything in between. What do you want to talk about? And so I'd get questions from the group, spend an hour with them. I'd buy them lunch or breakfast, depending on the time of day. And now I've connected with them with email. And now we've broken bread together. So now I have a connection. They know exactly what I stand for. And I think that, again, the Gen Zs and the Millennials, um, they're different. And yeah. so for all the leaders out there who are either a Gen Z or a Millennial or more than them, and the Gen Zs are my favorite. They're my favorite um, group I've ever managed. They, they, they expect you to be mission-driven and they want to know what you stand for and you can't hide. Mm. And they're not tied to you. And and they will work really hard and they're really smart and they understand your brand and their brand. And every day they're testing you. So they're like, okay, are you going to do it? By the way, they also are, they want transparency, complete information. They want to be promoted by tomorrow. You know, right. every day they're asking, they want to go in our office. But all that stuff they're going to work for, the social contract with them is totally different. Because it's like, are you in? Like, are you in? Do you believe? So, so you, you put that into you know, a, a time when we had a lot of strife in the U.S. with our president, you put that into like social injustice marches, you put that into, you know, how you manage and run an organization. And they're looking at you saying like, all right, big shot. You're the big guy, right? What do you stand for? What are you posting on social media? What are you ta- telling about? What are you talking about with your family? How are you managing people? Hey, we got somebody that's doing the wrong thing. What are you doing about it? Because I want to, because you know what? If I don't like it, I'm running. Mm-hmm. I don't have a house. I don't have a car. I don't care. And I love that. Like, I love that that push every day to figure out, okay, do we really stand for what we stand for? You know, so I, I think, I think I, I answer, I, I probably talk way too wide about culture settings. Um, but I think if it had to come down to one thing, it's like, you know, aligning around a set of things that, that, that really matter. Because I often say like, look, what, the culture that I want is different from other people, what other people, other leaders from other people want. And so if you're a private equity shop and all you care about is making money, that's, I'm not here to judge that, but, but like everybody should know that's what they care about. And you shouldn't mm-hmm. expect anything else. And that's okay. Like it's not, I mean, that's not how I want to work, but if that's what you want to do, then, you know, culture effectively is what you inspect and is what you celebrate and what you tolerate. Yeah. So culture is something we tolerate. So if I want to create a culture where money is everything, then a guy brings in a deal, I celebrate him. Mm-hmm. If he's a jerk, I tolerate him because that's what I'm saying. If you think being an extraordinary teammate is your best path in the culture you want to create, you know, celebrate and tolerate that. So if someone's an extraordinary teammate, celebrate him. So the extreme example is a salesperson. Say, say she's your best salesperson and she's a total jerk. How are you teammate? Hmm. Right, that's that's the kind of culture. And say that if it's the nicest guy in the world and you can't sell sell a thing, hey, you doing? Well, like, so you you have, I think you have to intentionally decide what you want, and you can manifest that through what you celebrate, what you tolerate. Um, but it's a uh, culture fickle these days. It's the most fickle it's ever been in my twenty five years. Oh, I would agree with that. Okay, a couple more questions, man. I can't believe how quickly the time has flown. This has been rich. We may have to do a round two at some point, Scott. This is uh, this is so good. Um, so you're trying to set a culture, but you also have superstar executives and you've got talent on the court, talent on the ice. And often those players come with big salaries and big egos. So you're managing a ton of egos and they have their own followers, right? Like you, you recruit a superstar, they kind of bring their own gravitational force. 
How do you manage culture in light of that, that you're dealing with so many superstars at so many different levels, like really bright people? Yeah. I mean, the way it works in our business is, is you know, that's, that's typically the general manager's job, you know? Mm-hmm. So the general manager manages the culture of basketball and hockey um, in a, in a, in a high functioning organization. We are completely aligned in terms of the values, the culture, and how it manifests itself on and off the court. Mm. And I've been with general managers where it is 100% in sync. And I've been with general managers where it is 100% out of sync. Um, The players, the players are what they are. They're wonderful. They're young and smart and driven. and, And the very nature of being an extraordinary athlete is that you have to be about yourself at some point. It's yeah. really interesting yes. to think about, right? Because everybody is sacrificing for you. Your mom is taking you to the rink at 4 a.m. in Manitoba, okay? Mm-hmm. I mean, that's... So everyone has sacrificed for you. And, and you have given up just about everything else, for the most part. Relationships, school, studies, um, a regular life, sleep in many cases, to be be extraordinary um, physically and have your gifts. And, um, and so that, that creates some issues. Um, the money thing doesn't really come into play. Guys kind of, I mean, they're salary caps in both. People generally make what they should generally. Hmm. Um, so that, that's not as big an issue. Um, but our, our challenge with teams is to create extraordinary teams. And extraordinary teams need different pieces. And people have to know their roles. And so... Coaches in some sports play a bigger role and lesser than others, and general managers play a bigger role in some and lesser than others. Um, but generally, the the ecosystem of of culture. Um, well, I'll use an example; it's probably easier to say. Like, there's a reason San Antonio Spurs won. I think they made the playoffs 23 or 24 years in a row. Okay, mm. and you could say, right, Scott, because they had Tim Duncan, Tim Sure, they're great players. And, by the way, there are plenty of organizations with great players. Look around. But why were they special? Like, why? Why were they different? Yeah, I spent quite a bit of time studying it. Um, you know, and, and there are organizations that win repeatedly and organizations that lose repeatedly. Three bomber clippers. They had several number one overall picks. Couldn't get out of their own way. Why? <laughs> like, it has to be about leadership and culture, right? Yeah, yeah. At a certain right? point. You have a, you have a mm-hmm. salary cap. At some point, like... Over time, it's, you can't take a moment in time and do it um, because it takes time to build an organization and it takes time to break one down and it's very cyclical. But if you look over over a period of time, you'll, you'll see, I would say, hey, you, you can just, you know, does the person, the leader, leave a place better than he or she found it? And that's it. You know, over an extended period of time, you, you have a pretty good sense of, of, of uh, the impact the leader can make. And that happens in sports and out of sports. As far as ego goes, in, in my humble opinion, that was a joke. Um, it is, um, <laughs> it's the great deal killer. Yeah. It's the great team killer. It's the great company killer. It's the great deal killer. And, um, and for, the, for the most part, I, as the older I get, the more humble I get, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, uh, you know, and, and I don't, I don't, don't mistake humility um, or don't mistake ego with confidence because I, I don't think right. anything can be anything can be accomplished without confident people and I, I think if there's one gift I want to give my daughters it's the, the gift of confidence hmm. that's a good gift um, I do feel like there's a whole podcast around this but I just I'd, I'd be remiss not to ask the question so not only are you renowned for culture and team building and growth um, but also innovation. Fast Company has put you on a list, as have other organizations of most innovative companies. When you were with uh, HBSC, SE, I should say, and with the 76ers and the Devils and so on, where do you see the future of sports heading? You also acquired an esport company, right? Yeah, yeah, we sure did. Future sports. Um, well, I can say let's talk about innovation first. Is yeah, it complete. It's a mindset. And, um, and I, th- I think the organization is going in a different direction now, unfortunately. Uh, not unfortunately, but it's, it's not that, that's not, I am inspired by doing things differently and mm. doing them first and doing them fast and taking chances and 
being willing to do, to fail, um, like celebrating trips and falls and, and the learnings we have. And, um, or, or you can just play a safe and be third or fourth. And, um, in, in the sports business, in the business side, it's, it's the easy, I mean, you can make it, we, we got more deals because we were innovative and different than you could shake a stick at. Um, and you have opportunities to create businesses and make businesses and people want to be with you and sponsors want to be with you. And so all those kind of get in. And it's a, it's a really, you can make a really compelling case why it matters. Um, but where is sports going, man? You know, I always like to look back at like the 50s and 60s. Um, and I just think of horse racing and boxing and how dominant they were. And uh, yeah, I, nobody would believe that today. Yeah. No, they wouldn't. They really wouldn't. And, and boxing did have a little heyday for sure in the nineties, but you know, they're nowhere to be found. Huh. And I, I, I think, I think about that as like a, you know, I've, I've been in football, I've been in the NFL and NHL and the NBA and esports, several leagues in esports. Um, I messed around in action sports quite a bit. And I guess that's just like a shot across the bow. It's mm-hmm. like, we need to keep iterating. I think, um, Commissioner Bettman's done a great job in the NHL, and, you know, after the last lockout, completely changed the game. You know, they made the two line pass, take away the, the clutching and grabbing, opening it up, changing overtime into three on three, which I think is spectacular. Um, I think the NBA, you look at the NBA in the in the nineties, it was like a slugfest, you know. Hmm. And now we get to see more of the beauty of the game. So I, I think, you know, you, those, are, those are two great examples of organizations that 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 don't want to be horse race, you know, and, and that. They continue to iterate and evolve to make sure that the game and the fans stay relevant. And you know, with the media landscape changing and social media becoming so important, and more and more young people just watching snippets of games versus whole games, we have to completely relook at at how we not only have the games but package the games. So, so I, I I don't know. Like if I had a, a magic a magic wand, I, I would I would bet on basketball um, as a sport. That's going to be around forever, just mostly because it's a global game. Uh, it's very cheap to play. Um, and the NBA, I mean, they're, you know, they have a league in China. They have a league in, in Africa now. I would imagine that next is coming South America. And so now you're, you're having a, a solid pipeline of talent. Um, all the while, you're building fan bases in, in each of the different continents around the world. It's, uh, that, that league is going to, it's got a good, very strong future. And it's a pretty young sport too. When you look at the fan base, much much younger than say Major League Baseball or I don't know about football. But well, Scott, I want to thank you. You've been very generous with your time today. Uh, the book is called "Be Where Your Feet Are." If you're watching it on YouTube, you can uh, see great book full of stories and lots of life principles. And uh, I'm so glad you've uh, connected with leaders. Hey, if people want to find you online, are you on social these days or obviously you can get the book anywhere? Yeah. Get the book at Amazon or Barnes & Noble. And if you're really ambitious, go to a local bookstore. Um, some of the yeah. indie bookstores are, are hurting right now. Just go just cruise into an indie bookstore and buy it. Um, but, but for me, you can get me on LinkedIn or Twitter at Scott O'Neill. Okay, awesome. Scott, thank you. I'll talk to you soon, I'm sure soon. Well, I hope today's episode was helpful to you. You can always get more by subscribing to my channel. I also have a lot more content over at kerryneuhoff.com for leaders in business and leaders in churches. And uh, you can get transcripts of this episode there and so much more, plus some other stuff I do for leaders. So head on over there to discover more at kerryneuhoff.com. And in the meantime, I really hope our time together today has helped you lead like never before.